Welcome back to r slash legal advice, where people ask questions, get advice and we get satisfaction. If you are new around here, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel to join our awesome community and without any further ado, let's dive right into the stories. And the first one is titled DHS took my son. This is a throwaway for obvious reasons. To give preface, me and my partner had a child two years ago out of wedlock before my son was born and her got in a fight not knowing at the time she was pregnant. We were both arrested for domestic assault, third degree. They later found out that she was pregnant and dropped her charge and upgraded mine to a felony. Later on, after we had our child, she would have me falsely arrested twice for felony domestic abuse and once for residential burglary and child endangerment. All of the charges were either dismissed or dropped completely. At the time of his birth, we both signed an acknowledgement of paternity and filled my son's birth certificate out with me as the father and gave him my surname. We never got joint custody because of money issues and never put much thought of what might happen. Well, she was arrested with my son for shoplifting and was given a child endangerment in the second degree charge as well. I had to leave work and pick my son up from where it happened at and the arresting officer told me he would be reporting it to the state child hotline. Well, I was worrying about my son's safety, cleaned and got together what paperwork I had showing as his biological and legal father. DHS contacted me two days later, asking me to bring him so they could check for signs of neglect. When I arrived, they asked for the paperwork I had for his paternity and then asked about the dismissed charges and I explained what had happened and told them I would gladly get the paperwork showing they were dismissed or dropped. At that point they told me my son was going into foster care because of what his mother had done and that as I had no legal custody, they could not leave him with me until I had gone in front of a judge to establish paternity. They did this late Friday and I've been a wreck since. My biggest fear is that his mother who is facing her own serious legal issues might not be released for a year or more and that the judge will tell me that I am not fit to care for my son because of my past. I will be getting an attorney but I need some plan of action to act upon and some input from people who were possibly in the same situation. And a user commented, here's your plan, hire a family law attorney, do exactly what he tells you, get your crap together and try to act like a sane human being for the next 16 years. Another person said, well, DFS is simply wrong, as long as the acknowledgement of paternity was properly completed, you are the legal father. I would suggest printing out the above law and take it to DHS. If the worker won't give you your kit back, ask for a manager slash supervisor, escalate as far as you can. If you still cannot get your child, you will need to get a lawyer. Update Arkansas DHS took my son. After almost six months of my son being placed in foster care because of his mother's actions, he is finally going to be returning home on Friday. For the first three months of the case, I struggled to get DHS to comply with the services they had been ordered to pay and that I could not initiate without them first starting the process. I felt like I was never actually considered anything other than a nuisance or a backup in case his mother could not get her stuff together. I rushed to complete my classes, attended all drug tests, traveled 60 miles each way to see my son and was never late let alone missed a visit and yet was being stonewalled by the department in completing my case plan in its entirety. After nearly a month of asking regularly about progress on their side of things, I contacted the county supervisor and asked who I needed to pay to complete the last steps of my case plan and informed them that my son's mother was in jail again for her second drug related felony since the case began. Wouldn't you know it, the very next day I was being contacted to schedule DNA testing and a psychological evaluation as well as being assigned a new caseworker who was much more helpful and actually answered her phone. I am proud to say that I've been legally acknowledged as the father of my son since November, that his permanency hearing date has been set and that I get to welcome him back into my life on Friday after preschool. Unfortunately, there are still many issues to resolve including dealing with the trauma and damage it has caused my child and his development. 
I am however certain that me and him can put our lives back together and hopefully with a competent lawyer, other than my current one, I might even be able to convince the state to contribute to my son's college or technical school fund. I will say that hiring a lawyer as initially planned was necessary, however not the key piece to my son's return. To my knowledge you cannot petition the state of Arkansas for paternity without one, so I am certainly glad that I did not spend a ton of money there. I should have paid for one that would show up to court dates on time, thank you everybody who initially gave advice or commented. And guys if you have watched until here, please don't forget to like the video and to post some star emojis in the comments if you want to support me. Thank you so much in advance. Next one is titled, my car was stolen in Virginia and nobody cares. I was leaving the country for a year and a half before I left I contacted a friend of a friend to do some work on my car and left it with him with the understanding that he could take his time on it because I would not be back to get it for up to two years. I dropped the car off in May of 2017 and in August 2018 my bank called me about a letter from the DMV that the person I dropped the car off with was filing for ownership of the abandoned vehicle. I tried calling him but the numbers I have are no good so I took leave and went back home for a week. During that week I went to his house and he pretended like he had no idea who I was and even claimed he knew nothing about filing an abandoned car report with the DMV. I went to the police and filed a stolen vehicle report and I filed a claim with my insurance. I spoke with my bank because they still hold the title and they wanted me to sign something allowing them to repossess the car but I don't want to give the car up so I did not do it. I do have a GPS on the car from them and they say it last reported in May of 2017, one block away from where I dropped it off at, so I gave that info to the police. The last place I went before leaving the country again was the DMV, they told me that I could just go get the car since it was filed as abandoned and not a mechanic's lien. The letter they gave me said that I had until 20th August 2018 to pick the car up or else they would transfer the title. I went to the guy's house again, I went to the place down the street that the GPS said it was at last year, I could not find it anywhere and both places have garages so it is probably inside one of them. I spoke with the DMV on the phone again and they would not give me any information, I explained that I cannot pick it up because I don't know where it is, I told them I filed a stolen vehicle report etc, they said they would investigate and get back with me. Since August I've been calling the police and the DMV and my insurance company every few days and none of them will return my calls. Throughout all of this my insurance company said that I would need to give them the mileage so they could get a valuation but I don't have the car and I don't know the mileage when I dropped it off and they stopped returning my calls since then. The police keep transferring me to the detective's extension but he has not answered or returned my messages ever. The DMV gives me the same runaround every time I talk to someone new, they need to investigate and call me back, but never do. I am coming back home next month so I will actually be able to go to these people in person soon but what do I do first? I have some sort of contract signed by the mechanic in storage but I'm not sure exactly what it says, if I remember correctly it was just a standard looking thing that he probably took from his job, he works for a chain of auto shops and was doing this for me on the site, by this time the DMV date of 20th August is long past, is there a chance they already transferred my title and am I screwed? And a fella in the comments said, hopefully you sent your insurance company and the bank a copy of the police report before the title transfer date. That aside, everyone has a boss, if the detective has not returned multiple calls, then escalate, ask for their boss and then their boss until you get a return call. Hopefully you've made notes each time you've left a message, but if not, make those notes to the best of your recollection so you can tell the boss, 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 etc. How many calls have been ignored? Most important, find that written agreement you have with the mechanic and read it thoroughly. If it says after x number of days it is considered abandoned, no matter what you guys discussed, the only thing that matters is what is on that piece of paper. And guys what would you have done if you were in OP situation and this happened to your own car? Let us know in the comments. 
Update to the stolen car story. Update, I kept bugging anyone and everyone at the DMV, police station and insurance company for a week straight until someone at the police finally notified me that the car had actually already been picked up and impounded in November of 2018. They found it completely stripped, missing engine, the works, it had been dumped in a neighboring city, behind an abandoned house that had been boarded up since at least 2012, based on the Google Street views of the house, equipped with that new information I was able to get the insurance company to do their thing and they wrote me a check for a fair amount. I filed some more paperwork with the police, since obviously a crime took place but they did not really care and nothing more came of it. And the next one is titled, Ex-Husband told his mother he was going to shoot me, in Virginia. My unstable and mentally ill ex-husband was hysterical and angry and told his mother over the phone that he was going to come to my job and shoot me in the face and then end his life. This went on for 5 hours, I was terrified and immediately left work, notified my employer, packed my kids up and left town. I already have a protective order because of other incidents for myself and our two children. Is there no legal recourse? I was told by the police that there was nothing they could charge him with. They said that if he told me directly, then they would arrest him because it would be a violation of the no contact protective order. It just seems ridiculous that you can make a threat on that level and it is okay as far as the law goes, but I understand people have rights. Update. Thanks all, I've been in contact with victim slash witness and they are helpful in helping me contact with the local women's shelter. I am extremely blessed to have a supportive relationship with his mother, a police report was filed, I am taking the threat seriously and will be vigilant. You just never know and it is a scary situation overall. And a user in the comment said, some protection orders in my state also cover third party contact, meaning if he knew that mom would communicate the threats to you, then it can still be a violation of the order, at the very least document any contact you two have and contact the victim's advocate at your local agency, a lot of times they have better tools to help you than patrol cops. And another person said, find a lawyer and take the threat seriously, a friend of mine was killed last year by her ex-husband, he came into her home and shot her and seven of her guests. Not to scare you, but take it seriously, you never know what might happen. Find a good lawyer and weigh your options, I'm glad his mother and you have a good relationship. Good move on getting to a safe place. And guys, unfortunately, that last update is all we got for this story. I tried to contact the OP, but unfortunately the story was just too old and there was no way to contact her. Let's just hope that in the end this guy went to the loony bin or something and did not hurt anyone. And the next one is titled, Vet won't let us know who has stolen our dog. About three months ago, our golden retriever was stolen out of our backyard during the middle of the day. Lock on backyard gate was intentionally busted open with a crowbar. Yesterday, we got a call from a vet about 50 miles away saying a woman had brought in the dog as her own. The vet knew to call us because we had her microchipped with our info. We rushed right over, but by the time we arrived at the clinic, this woman had left with our dog. The vet said he told her the dog was ours, but she refused to believe it and left. The vet refuses to give us any contact information for this woman so we can get our dog back, citing patient privacy issues. What can we do to get our dog back? And a user in the comments said, call the police and report a stolen pet, give them the contact info for the vet, if they won't help, escalate up the police chain of command and contact the local police for the vet's area. And another person confirmed, yes, this, animals are property, so property laws apply. You can contact animal control for the veterinarian's jurisdiction, but as an ACO myself, we have to have police initiate all of this and essentially we can assist the police by scanning the dog and verifying the chip information ourselves. And another person in the legal advice comment section said the following, OP should also keep in mind it is possible the woman who has the dog is not the one who stole the dog, so she may feel like she owns the dog fair and square, especially if she got it from a shelter. For example, someone might have been hoping to steal something else from the backyard, dog got out, got picked up and taken to a shelter, she may fight tooth and nail, but hopefully not. 
update to the stolen dog story. We took a copy of the police report from when our yard was first broken into three months ago to the police in the county where the vet is. The sheriff's office was very sympathetic and said they would go to the vet to find out the contact information. The vet willingly gave the information to the police and the police went to the lady's house. She let them in and confirmed that she had been to see the vet last week. She let them look around the house and the backyard, but they did not find our dog or any other dog. When they started asking about our golden retriever, she refused to answer any further questions and asked the police to leave. The sheriff's office said they don't have enough evidence to do anything to move forward at this point. The sheriff's office confirmed with the vet by description that the woman whose house they went to was the same one who brought in our dog to the vet. Is there anything else we can do at this point legally? We just really want our dog back home. And guys, I was just about to say, unfortunately, there's no final update, but then I checked again and now it says, final update, vet won't let us know who has stolen our dog. Thank God I checked again. I received a phone call earlier this week that our dog had been found hit by a car on the side of the highway about 40 miles from where we live and had to be euthanized shortly after being picked up by animal control. She did not have her collar on, but they were able to identify her slash callers based on the microchip we originally had placed. Animal control thinks based on where she found she was likely abandoned on the side of the road as it is not close or easily accessible to any residential areas. On Animal Control's recommendation, we had them perform a necropsy. They are reasonably certain she had given birth in the past month or two, was slightly underweight from nursing, but otherwise healthy. Thank you everyone who offered advice and kind words. My wife and I read every last comment. A special thanks to those who reached out and helped us contact regional shelters and vets. And guys, this marks the end of the first part of the video. The second part is gonna be comprised of a set of older stories that some of you might have heard already if you are a loyal subscriber. However, if you are new to the channel, these stories will be new for you as well. Landlord suing me over doors I broke down while our five-story apartment building was on fire. On December 28th, a fire erupted on the second floor of our apartment building, which we learned came from a meth lab. I live on the fourth floor and tenants who had the meth lab was directly below the person below me, while we faced the opposite direction of the street. I noticed the fire engulfing the apartment through a reflection and started banging on people's doors to tell them to get out. The area that I was living in was not the best place and crime occurs frequently, so many people like staying indoors and don't like opening doors. What I learned after the fact was that the fire alarm that the building had was not currently operational supposedly, so no alarms would go off when I pulled the fire alarm. I ended up kicking down about four doors that people refused to open and told them to get out due to the fire and we all ended up going down the fire escape and no injuries occurred through this ordeal. The fire department came and put out the fire which did not end up reaching fourth floor so it was safe minus any structural damage that occurred. I told the fire department that I broke down the doors and the landlord slash owner came out of nowhere and told me I would have to pay for those doors or get sued for the total cost. I realized there are many factors, but could I actually be forced to pay this? And then a user in the comments said, the fire marshal will love to know about this then, the building may be condemned if the landlord does not correct this in short order. In regards to the fire alarm that was actually not operational at the time this occurred. Anyway, however, you did not have the authority to break into other people's units to inform them of the fire or to command them to leave. It is probably good on the balance that you did, but you likely are liable to the portion of the damage that you caused. You could negotiate, you could pay up if your landlord will put the settlement in writing, you could wait and see if he sues, I cannot think of any obvious right choice, but further discussion is probably futile either way. And guys, I'm curious, have you ever been affected by an awful landlord? Let us know in the comments. And the next one is the update to the apartment building story. 
The brother of one of my co-workers is a lawyer, so I met with him, who chose to advise me for free, and I chose to remain silent on the original threat until everything gets settled. A little more anticlimactic than I thought would happen. I went to meet with the fire marshal and he was already up to speed with the chain of events and the fact that the fire alarms were not working and the fact that there was an actual meth lab on the second floor. He informed me he was going to levy a number of fines on the landlord with addition to other things I was not aware of. The tenants who had the meth lab in their apartment were arrested along with having their child taken away from them. Their next door neighbors were the actual minds behind the lab and were also arrested. Regarding the landlord saying he was going to sue me, he was just blowing smoke and was full of complete crap and in lieu of lawsuits from other tenants, he released everyone that asked from their lease and paid an undisclosed amount of money to quite a few. Where did he get this money? Apparently his father is some multimillionaire, but even that could not allow him to afford a working fire alarm system within the building. That's all the info I have for now, thanks y'all. Seems about right, be a millionaire, but don't even have a fire alarm for your poor tenants. What an awful awful landlord. And the next one is titled, Girlfriend Fired for Sexual Assault. Thanks in advance for any help, over the weekend my son received a call from a detective letting him know that a girl he dated for a week and a half at the college at the end of 2015, freshman 2015 until 2016, filed some time ago a charge, not sure if this is the actual name of what she filed, for sexual assault and asked if my son can meet the detective this week. He agreed to see the detective and set a day and time for this week. He called me this morning and let me know I am really worried and need advice on what should be my advice to him and next steps. I asked him about the girl and he told me they dated for no more than a week and a half, did not have intercourse but they did have intimate moments, meaning touching, kissing etc. He told me he thought they were in good terms until this call. He did not interact much with her for most of 2016 as they are pursuing different degrees and did not have classes together. I believe him, I understand there are always two sides of a story, but he has been always an excellent person, student and noble guy. First, should I find an attorney for him prior to the interview, even postponing the interview until I find an attorney for him? Second, postponing the interview and bringing an attorney does not look bad on him. Third, he is 18, so an adult, should I attempt to call the detective and try to find more information? I think he got really scared when he was called and maybe did not gather all the pertinent details. If yes, what can I ask the detective? Four, if the suggestion is to have an attorney for the interview, what should I ask the attorney? What is a good selection process? We are not wealthy, I understand this is going to cost us a lot of money, any ballpark on how much this could cost so we can plan for this would be much appreciated. And a user in the comments suggested, he needs an attorney, he should not speak to the police under any circumstances without an attorney. Bringing an attorney to the meeting does not look bad, it looks smart. Do not contact the detectives, do not have your son contact the detectives, hire an attorney and let them contact the detectives. Contact your local bar directory to ask about reputable criminal defense attorneys in your area. No one can give you a ballpark, totally depends on the going rates for attorneys in your area as well as how long this entire thing takes. Could be that it is cleared up after meeting with the detectives, could be that charges are filed and it gets to pre-trial, could be that it goes to trial. And guys honestly this is a very difficult situation, but I'm curious what would you suggest the mother to do? Let us know in the comments. And the next one is an update to the sexual assault story. First of all, thanks to all who provided feedback. It was really helpful, I meant to post this earlier but it is a throwaway account and was until now I figured the password. Besides the situation, the hardest part was to find an attorney, I went to my local bar website, searched for attorneys, but all the options were totally unknown to me and given how grave was the situation, I did not know who to pick. I called two highly rated and the first thing that came from their mouth was dollar dollar dollars. 
I needed someone to trust my son's life, not a merchant. Yes, I have friends and acquaintances that are attorneys, but I did not want to bring shame to my son, rationally I know this is secondary, but was a factor. I ended up asking some friends for the name of their divorce attorney because they speak very well about the firm, called their office and explained the secretary that I needed to talk to the attorney but for a referral and explained what about and gave my friend's name as reference and asked for confidentiality. My friend's attorney called and calmed me and recommended an attorney. This was huge. I called the attorney, explained the situation and she communicated, focusing on the problem, how to address it and not how much it would cost me. Although it was already early afternoon, she set a meeting with us the same day in the evening. We met with her that evening, prior to the meeting I asked my son to print all the text messages and as he is on my family plan, I printed the call logs. My son sat with the attorney and the attorney called the detective and let them know that my son would not be going to the next day conversation and offered to talk about the situation. Later the same week she called my son for a meet to go over the call log and text messages as she had questions about them, they met and asked my son to sit tight and wait for her call. The attorney called the detective, went over the timeline of the report, who was really calling who, etc. Within the next four weeks the attorney called us and told us that the detective after reviewing the evidence recommended to the prosecutor not to pursue charges and the prosecutor agreed no charges were pressed. My son did not need to meet the detective, there was no citation issued and sadly learned the hard way about people and relationships. The key takeaway is, do not talk to the police without an attorney, if you do not know an attorney, a friend does, civil, family, etc, reach out to them. So basically guys, if I understood this correctly, the ex-girlfriend of this guy falsely accused him of something awful and honestly, even for the future, what could that guy do different? Like what is the lesson you can take away from this? Honestly, I'm not really sure because it seems like this could happen to any guy pretty much. Please correct me if I am totally wrong here. The next one is actually from r slash relationship advice and is titled My son and his friend are a couple. How do I let them know it is okay? Hello Reddit, please bear with me regarding my formatting and things. I have read the rules and things but I am an old fart who is rather on the wrong side of 40 so I am not overly well versed in the art of efficient internetting. My boy is 20 years old, he's absolutely my pride and joy and there is nothing he could do that would ever make me love him less. For the first half of his life I regrettably was not involved very much. His mother and I parted ways when he was just a few months old and at the time I was struggling with a heroin addiction and was absolutely not as present in his life as I should have been nor was I suited to fatherhood at all. I saw him at most two to three times a year for the first 12 years of his life. I won't discuss details because that is his private story to tell but when he was 12 he revealed to me that he was being badly mistreated at the hands of his mother and her boyfriend. Despite not being the best father at the time I did not want my boy suffering anymore so I got myself cleaned up and sorted out in order to get full custody of him. I've effectively been a single and sober father ever since and he has little to no contact with his mother. He is everything a man could want his son to be, he is uniquely kind and fiercely loyal, he is unflinchingly brave, he is incredibly generous and, despite the horrors he suffered as a child, he is unfailingly positive and sunny to the last. Somehow I, of all people, was bestowed with the honor of watching him grow from a sweet young boy to the greatest man I have ever known. I cannot stress enough my pride in him. When he was 18 he got accepted into a top ranking university on the other side of the country. I was sad to see him go but simultaneously overjoyed that he got into his first choice and was starting a new chapter in his life. He comes home once every other month and on the month he does not come home I go to visit him. He is doing well in university, has made lots of friends and seems incredibly happy there which I am obviously chuffed about. Since his second year he has lived with his friend in a flat off campus. 
I have strongly suspected since his early teens that my son is gay and I now more or less have confirmation that this is true and that his friend is actually his boyfriend. So for this virus stuff my son decided he would rather come home and quarantine at mine than stay at his university flat. His friend however would be left alone if my son came back as he is a Canadian and his family are back over there. And I gather he does not have the best relationship with them anyway. He asked if it would be okay if the friend tagged along to my house and I said of course no problem. They have been back at mine for about 6 weeks now, they think they are being subtle I know, but I've caught them doing coupley things on several occasions now, the friend has slipped up a couple of times and called my son babe and sweetie in front of me which I pretended not to notice for the sake of saving embarrassment. There have been nights where I will be watching a film with the lights off and thinking I cannot see my son will have his arm around the friend. One day I walked into the lounge and I'm positive they had just been kissing and were trying to cover it though I admit I have no confirmation on that one. The most solid evidence however came a few mornings ago I get up very early to go for runs in the morning hence why I am making a reddit post at 5 in the morning as far as I was told my son was sleeping in his childhood room and his friend was in the guest room. I don't know what possessed me to do so but on Tuesday morning I cracked my son's door open to check on him like I used to when he was a kid. Lo and behold they are both asleep snuggled up together in my son's bed. That is more or less solidified for me that they are together. I did not say anything just shut the door and went for my run and I have not mentioned it to them yet. What I want advice on is this. How do I let my son and his boyfriend know that I'm okay with them being a couple and they don't have to feel like they have to sneak around in my house. I want them to be comfortable here and I want them to know I support them both no matter what. Or is that not a good idea? Am I better off leaving it alone and waiting until they tell me themselves if they ever do? I obviously don't want to force either of them out of the closet but at the same time I hate feeling as if they feel like they are being forced into the closet in my house. What is my best course of action here? You are an awesome dad, I'm so glad you were able to clean up your life and become such an amazing father to your son. I hope he knows and sees that too. I am lesbian and I can totally relate to what your son is doing and feeling. I like the above advice and just referring to your son's friend as his boyfriend. It is casual and your tone will be the telltale sign in all of it. You could also write a letter addressed to him if you wish. I think that would be really sweet and I would keep it forever if I were him. Thanks for being one of the good ones. And I don't know about you guys but everything about this father just screams awesome. However if you were in this situation what would you suggest the OP to do? Do you think a letter is the right choice? Let us know in the comments. And the next one is an update to the story from before. Hello lovely people, as promised I am back with an update for you on all what happened the other day. Here it is if you missed it. Want to top this off with a big thank you to everyone who left such lovely thoughtful comments. I honestly did not expect so many people to see the post. I was thinking maybe an absolute maximum of 100 people and even that seemed like loads. It was lovely to hear back from so many of you and I'm forever grateful for the fantastic advice most of you gave. Also overjoyed by my new adopted reddit children, ha <laughs> you're all doing amazing and I'm very proud of all of you. Also big thanks to all of the lovely people who sent me such sweet messages of support and to those of you who reached out to me because you felt you needed someone to talk to. If anyone else feels that way and is in need of deadly advice do feel free to give me a message and I will do my best to help you out. Okay you all want me to shut up and tell you what happened. My son was busy with some assignments both for his freelancing job and his university work most of the day and I did not want to disturb him so I waited until after dinner to chat. Friend went to have a bath while my son and I watched television. I told him face to face son I love you very much you don't have to tell me anything you don't want to but I want you and friend to feel comfortable being yourselves in my home and you don't ever need to hide anything from me alright. 
Well, it turns out a hell of a lot of you were right. Sun burst out laughing and said, Oh, thank God. I reckoned you had clicked on, but didn't say anything because I did not want to make you feel weird. Basically, we have each been pussyfooting around the topic because neither one of us wanted to make the other uncomfortable talking about it. We had a bit of a chat and he confirmed that I'm right in thinking they have been together since their first year of university and that is why they moved in together in second year. However, apparently I'm not as brilliant and intuitive as I thought because apparently one of his friends in secondary school was his boyfriend for a year and I had absolutely no idea. He went and talked to the boyfriend after his bath and then we all had a bit of a further chat. Sadly, a lot of you were right that the reason boyfriend does not have a good relationship with his parents is because he came out to them a few years ago and they effectively disowned him. So I made sure he knows that he is a part of our family now. Sorry if that is not all as exciting and groundbreaking as some of you had hoped. I'm glad this is something my boy no longer feels he has to keep from me and I'm very glad he's happy with his partner. Thank you all again for the help. And guys, if you ask me, this was a beautiful, wholesome story. Let me know in the comments if you enjoy r slash relationship advice and maybe I will do some more of it. And the last story is titled Legality of Horse Sacrifice in California. I am about to attend a religious ceremony where a horse will be sacrificed. I was wondering if what is happening is legal and whether I would be in trouble. I won't be the person who performs the ritual. And a user in the comments said, that is almost certainly going to be animal cruelty and you could be charged for participating. Another person said, 508 US 520, the case name is too annoying to type, depending on how they do it, it may not be prohibitable. And then another person said, Church of the Lukumi Babalu A Inc, for those who are curious. And guys, honestly, I'm not sure what that means. Maybe that is the crazy church that performs the ritual. I have no idea. If you know more, please let us know in the comments. First update to the horse sacrifice story. I did not go to the ceremony. I thought long and hard about it and decided that this is not something I want to support. The ceremony was held and the horse was sacrificed, but I was not there to see it. I will continue to attend ceremonies that do not include animal sacrifice. In the next ceremony, an ostrich will be sacrificed. And now the last update to the horse story. I have exited the religious group. I did not know, but the ceremonies were being filmed. A video of the horse sacrifice was leaked and given to the police and the person performing the ritual was arrested for animal cruelty and killing a horse. I was not in the video since I did not attend that event. Thanks for convincing me not to attend. These people were very manipulative. They found me in a vulnerable moment and helped me but also brainwashed me. I will try to make better friends from now on. And a user in the comments said, I guess that is the best outcome we can hope for at this point. Also, I have to say, I was pretty appalled at how many people in previous threads were defending the cultists or talking about how it is just slaughtering any other animal. I would agree if we were talking about people who knew what they were doing, humanly slaughtering a horse. But holy crap, these were some random cultists planning to plunge a effing sword into the poor animal's neck. And on top of that, exsanguination is not considered a humane method of euthanasia for horses by itself, at least not by any veterinary school or association I'm familiar with. It needs to be paired with stunning or anesthesia. The only time it can be humane is if, like, your horse breaks its leg in the middle of nowhere and you don't have a gun or drugs and even then it is just a more humane option, not an ideal one. I am not squeamish, I have actually euthanized one horse by gunshot and been involved with the euthanasia of a bunch of others, in turning with a vet plus growing up on a ranch and have humanely killed other livestock for meat or due to health issues. I don't have a problem with horse slaughter either, but man, just because you can humanly slaughter horses does not mean that this was going to be an instance of that and I would think anyone with experience in that area could tell from a mile off that a cultist slashing a horse's neck with a sword was not going to be humane in the slightest. 
And guys, unfortunately, we have already reached the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed today's stories. And if you haven't already, please also go to patreon.com slash ripe YouTube, where I upload exclusive Reddit videos starting at just $3 a month. This is a great way to support me in case you are interested and the chance for me to become independent from YouTube revenue. Thank you so much for watching, please don't forget to subscribe and like the video and I hope to see you again tomorrow.